bit on uh, some thermal effects. If there's time at the end, then we'll just deal with any questions before the, the last test. Um, this is in, in uh, the eighth edition of Hibbler. This is generally section 4.6, so I don't often uh, I don't often get it get into it. So it's kind of nice to to do this a little bit. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, the idea, of course, that uh, you've all experienced in some way is that uh, we've assumed so far that everything uh, put together as all the pieces were at the same temperature. Well, we didn't assume it. We just passed right over it. All the pieces put together were at the same temperature and that the operating conditions for the object was uh, the same temperature as, as uh, used for the actual construction. But you know from experience that generally things tend to expand a little bit given some temperature increase. So if we start with a piece that is some temperature T, at some temperature T plus delta T, just some uh, increase, uh, it can be a decrease of course, but then it would be uh, generally a shrinkage. Uh, we see this, this expansion, this uh, uh, lengthening of the piece, and we'll call that del, which is our usual symbol for these minor changes in dimension. <coughs> we'll put a little T on it for uh, change in length due to temperature increase or thermal, uh, thermal considerations. And uh, we have to put these in uh, because any of these kind of strains, and this is a strain, it's a thermal strain, thermally induced strain, but uh, stresses generally come with it. So we define this experimental uh, property of materials, uh, experimentally determined only, the coefficient of thermal expansion. And it's simply a matter of taking material and monitoring how much its dimensions change as the temperatures of it change. Uh, possibly you did something with this in, in uh, physics 2. I think the, the symbol used by the physics books is a beta. We, uh, this book happens to use an alpha for the coefficient of thermal expansion. But defined as, as the uh, amount of length of change with respect to the original length times the amount of temperature change there was from the uh, original condition. And notice that this uh, little part over there is actually what we've called the strain. The length, uh, the, the ratio of the length to the original length of the material. So. And it's experimentally determined. It's a property of the solid. It's in the back of your book as the very last column of the thermal properties of the book. So it's very easy to look up. It tends to have units of something like 1 over degree Fahrenheit. Remember that strain has no units. So this has just the temperature on the bottom. Uh, 1 over <coughs> Celsius. And if you think about it for a second, it doesn't actually matter if these are temperatures in Fahrenheit or Rankine or in Celsius or Kelvin because the, the amount of temperature change is the same size for whether it's Fahrenheit or Rankine. Are you guys familiar with Rankine? No, I was about to ask you what okay. it was. It's the, it's the equivalent of Kelvin. Kelvin. Uh, it's, it's zero in degrees Rankine is the same as zero in degrees Kelvin. And then uh, the temperature degrees from then on are Fahrenheit size degrees and 
from uh, zero at Kelvin, their Celsius size degrees. So, since all we're worried is uh, worried about is the change in the temperature, it doesn't matter which of the two you use, just as long as you're consistent with whether it's SI or English units. But uh, when you have the change in temperature, Fahrenheit and Rankine are the same change in temperature. Celsius and Kelvin are the same change in, uh, in uh, temperature as well. So we'll put a little T on that epsilon since that's the thermal strain or thermally induced strain. And it's not very difficult to measure. Did you happen to do that lab? We have the equipment to do it. And uh, did you do that in physics too? We have some long pipes. Uh, we just run some hot water through them and a micrometer at the end and you measure the uh, temperature change with the length change. So it's rather easy to do. And then come up with the, uh, the thermal strain that way. So the way it's going to affect us is ways we've looked at before where if we have uh, a piece that might be constrained we imagine first allowing it to lengthen because of a temperature change and of course uh, we're assuming all properties are constant throughout the piece it's an isotropic homogeneous uh, constant uniform uh, cross-section uh, structural member of some kind. There is some expansion in the uh, radial direction. The thickness gets a little bit more, but it's uh, a, a minor concern. Plus, it's of the same ratio if we're talking about homogeneous uh, isotropic materials, which, of course, we are. So. We imagine that there's some temperature change causes the piece to expand, but because of the constraints of the um, supports, we also know that there's got to be some force induced in the material, and that's going to be the strain, sorry, the stress that we calculate, and this maybe we'll call it del P, uh, those two have got to be equal and opposite and from that we'll be able then to get the stress in the material along with the observed strain. Induced strain I guess is a better word since it doesn't really strain because of the immovability of the, uh, of the constraints there. So we have this thermal expansion that we expect that is a function of this coefficient of thermal expansion, the original length, and the temperature change of the material. <coughs> Relatively straightforward calculating that. And then the uh, amount that we need to force it back to give us the original condition of being between immovable constraints. We've been doing that for weeks and know how to find it. And from the fact that these, the two of these are equal to each other, then we can find the stress induced because of this thermal expansion. So given the uh, change in temperature, the thermal expansion, the other uh, material properties, we can, we can figure all this out then. And from that, we get the stress. And remember, when we were calculating stress, it was always per original area. So the fact that this expands radially is not of great concern. So when we put these two in there and solve we get something like minus E, which is, uh, as always, uh, Young's modulus, alpha delta T. The minus sign 
works well it, algebraically it comes into the piece anyway because of the uh, of the original equation but it does give us a compression if the temperature change is positive and vice versa which is exactly what we saw there so we can handle the fact that the piece may actually get colder delta t would be negative if delta t is negative the two cancel each other, we then have a, a positive stress because we're actually going to have to put the piece in tension to uh, bring it back out to its original position. Just this picture uh, essentially run backwards with a, a negative delta T. And in fact, we'll, we'll just do a couple problems now and then uh, be done with it. It's very straightforward, very much like some of the other stuff we've done. Uh, when we were doing, especially when we were doing uh, um, statically indeterminate problems, which we did, I don't know what, 10 weeks ago. You guys have learned a lot, haven't you? Despite your efforts to the contrary sometimes. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll do a, a quick problem with it. Imagine between two immovable strain, uh, constraints, and this, this, you know, it's not necessarily that we're just putting these pieces between big walls. It's just we're, we have to model what's going on with just the piece itself. So it's, it's sort of like a free body diagram business, I guess, where there certainly are other things in the problem. We're just uh, we're just trying to look at the one piece, and then when you get to real engineering, you're going to have to put all the pieces together. All right, so we've got a piece here made of two different diameters, but the two pieces are each the same length. And the areas not 0 0.12, 1.2 square inches. So that's the areas already given there. And we'll use A36 structural steel. And just means that in the book you can get E and alpha for that material right out of there. And uh, Imagine that this was put in there with no stretch, just a tight, close fit at the uh, original temperature of 95 degrees. Sorry, 75. Late in the term, can't even read my own handwriting. Not that I always look at anyone. 75 degrees. But operating condition is expected to be somewhere around. Minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, yeah, so we've got all the pieces. So we want to find the, um, find the stresses in the two pieces, uh, the, the two different sides of it. We'll call this one one and that one, two. So find the stresses in one and two. There's actually zero stra uh, strain because there's no change in dimension, but it's the very same type of thing as I just pictured a little bit before. It's just, uh, in this case, because of the drop in temperature, we expect there to be a decrease in the length because the thermal expansion will be negative since delta T is negative. So we'll have some delta T, some delta T back in this direction as the piece changes length and then we want to find the reaction by finding the force that would be required 
if we pulled it back to its original length by modeling with that a change in uh, in uh, in length due to the tension we're going to have to uh, apply. Uh, this of course means that uh, in some way it's actually attached, maybe welded to those immovable supports. So as it changes, lowers temperature, tries to shrink but can't, and that <coughs> gives us the reaction of the support pulling it back and it's to its original length. All right, so we'll need some of those uh, material properties. Um, uh, well, somewhere, oh, the alpha, uh, the thermal coefficient of thermal expansion for A36 steel, just in the back of the book, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 6 per degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that's per change in degrees Fahrenheit, which in this case we have what? Uh, 100 minus 125. And I don't see where I have uh, the E actually written down, so if somebody's got their book. Twenty-nine times ten to the who? KSI. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right, so we can figure out the uh, change, thermal change in the pieces that are expected. This is the this is the length they would change if they were free to do so, but they're not because of the uh, attachment to the um, extreme pieces, or to the, the support pieces. But that's the uh, business we just uh, looked at, alpha L delta T. So we've got all that. It's easy just to put it in and observe what the expected change in length would be. Notice that this does not, uh, we don't have to split it into the two parts um, because of the different uh, cross-sectional areas. That's not an effect of it. So, it's a very, very straightforward number to calculate. And because of the very small coefficient of thermal expansion, it's a very small number itself. It comes out to be minus 19.8 times 10 to the minus 3, and that's in inches. So that's what its change in length would be if it was free to do so. But because it's attached to an immovable support, we need to pull it back out to uh, an appropriate length in the other direction, which we know is going to have to be plus 19.8 times 10 to the minus 3 inches. And we do that just as we did before. This time we do need to figure out What are the two contributions because of the two different saw, uh, two different cross sections of the pieces themselves? Now that P, the P1 and P2, is actually the same throughout the piece, and it's just this reaction support we're looking for. So we can pull that out in front. The E1 and E2, it's the same material, so we'll just drop the subscript on that and pull that out in front. Just a little bit of algebra. And so it becomes 
times L1 over A1 plus L2 over A2. Remember, these are the original lengths and the original areas, just as we've done this before. So we've, let's say we've got all those pieces. We've got P, E, L, and A, it's all in there. And we can then figure out that the, oh, and then we, we no, P we don't have. Uh, we set it equal to this and solve for P. And that's what we're looking for. Uh, well, we need that to find the stress. Uh, so this turns out to be 19.1 kip. The tensile force the piece is experiencing in order to keep it at the same length despite this uh, rather extreme change in temperatures. And then from that, we can find the stresses in the individual pieces. It's that piece, uh, that force over the area of each of the pieces. And again, uh, the original areas. So, not a difficult, uh, not a difficult concept. Not difficult calculations here. Just a matter of keeping the numbers straight. And of course, there's half the stress in the bigger piece because there's twice the area to uh, to absorb that that piece. That stress. All right. I think one of the interesting aspects of it is to determine what actually happens to this uh, point where the two pieces come together. You might think that that will not move, the two pieces will move on either side of it, but we can figure out which by determining what the strain is. Remember that's just uh, found from alpha delta T. That will give us the strain. And so we can figure out the strain in the two pieces. Uh, for each piece, it's the uh, thermal strain plus the mechanical strain. So for the first piece it would be just that and we can find this from uh, from our regular uh, type calculations. That will give us the thermal strain. Um, and you notice it's going to be the same for both of them, for both uh, uh, section 1 and section 2. And that comes out to be uh, minus 8.25 times 10 to the minus 6th. And remember, strain is in units of something like inches per inch. And that's good for both of them because uh, it has nothing to do with the area or the original length in that straight calculation. But we can get the mechanical strain for piece one, remembering that uh, Young's modulus is defined as the stress over the strain. So, uh, it's been a while since we looked at this. So we know that that's going to be then the, uh, the stress that we just found over Young's modulus for the material. So the stress we just found is the 31.9 KSI. Uh, And Young's modulus, uh, oh, we had it, I erased it. 29 times 10 to the third KSI. 
So the mechanical strain in the first one is uh, plus 275 times 10 to the minus 6. Just to remind you, we also often took out the 10 to the minus 6 and just put in the symbol micros, micro inches per inch. And that, oh wait, 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 that's, sorry, that's not the right, that's the total stress. That's the two of them put together. So let me get this one in there first. It's 1,100 micros. So the stress in the first piece is the two of those added together for the first piece. So that's, uh, we've got that now. It's the, uh, the uh, strain due to the shrinking from the delta T and then the mechanical strain due to uh, expanding it back, leaving a, a redu an induced strain of the two of these added together, and that is the 275, a pop plus 275 micro inches per inch is uh, induced in the, the piece uh, due to the thermal and the mechanical strain in just that first section. Then you have to do it again for the second section and if you do so it comes out to be the opposite of that. Which makes sense because there was no change in length of the material. What's interesting, I think, is we can now find the change in length of each of the two sections due to the strain experienced in each of those and so that's uh, uh, the strain times its length the original length remember and for piece one it experiences a positive zero zero three three inches and for piece two it turns out as it should that it's the opposite of that because the total change in length was zero remember it was it was stuck between two immovable uh, supports at either end However, if you look at this, it means that that midpoint actually shifted a bit <coughs> to the right. So we get a little bit of a shift of that point to the right to the tune of um, 3.3 mils or thousandths of an inch. Which, I don't know that would be obvious from the start. I think the, the, uh, your intuition would tell you that the, the interface between the two different areas would probably stay at the same spot, but it doesn't. It actually shifts to the right. So if that's there because some part of the machine or structure connects there, that also has to be taken into account uh, in addition to the stresses and uh, strains in each of the different pieces. Relatively straightforward, uh, just kind of a matter of trying to keep all the little pieces straight, all the, all the, the numbers straight in whichever spot they go. But like that, that interesting conclusion.
that the middle of the bar actually shifts to the right a little bit. Okay. So one more problem, then we'll be done with it. Imagine a rigid bar fixed at one end and with two kinds of supports. A brass cylinder there and a threaded tie rod there. Each of them on a, an immovable support of some kind at the bottom. So again, we're, we're going to be concerned with two different pieces. So for the problem, their properties are, again, this is A36 steel. So any properties we need are right out of the book. We'll do it in metrics. So that's 200 megapascals. Sorry, gigapascals. What else do we need? Uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. Actually, we're not going to uh, model any temperature change in that piece. We're going to put all the temperature change in piece two, as if this was some part of a structure, and for some reason two would heat up and one wouldn't, which for buildings is could be a concern because you'll have part of the building in sun and part of the building in shade. So you have to, uh, you have to get these pieces to uh, fight against each other sometimes. The diameter, 22 millimeters, and the length, 0.9 meters. So that's the piece one. Piece two is a solid brass cylinder, and we'll use the properties of Young's modulus 101 gigapascals. This is going to change temperature. So we'll need its coefficient of thermal expansion at its diameter, 30 millimeters. <coughs> and its temperature, oh, I need two other pieces. The, the distance between these, 0.45 meters and 0.3 meters there. Okay. So they, this all snugly fits together, and that, that is a, a matter of just being able to slip the brass cylinder in there and snug down the rod so it's just, uh, just snug, not uh, any great stresses induced there. So we want to find the stresses in the brass um, when the change in temperature put them together 20 degrees we expect that to get to 50 degrees so that will be a plus 30 degree change in temperature so the, the piece 2 is going to expand uh, this is a rigid bar here, which means we don't take it to have any deflection of its own in this first part of the model. Otherwise, we would have to take it in that into account. But we looked at that uh, a couple weeks ago, so we could add that in. But we're not adding it in on this one. And 
And so we need to find the stresses in the, uh, in the brass. Um, it's not a big deal if we wanted to find it in the, uh, in the other piece as well. Okay. Because of this, we expect a free body diagram of that rigid bar to look something like actually the whole structure. There's going to be a reaction there in the brass piece that'll be up. And because that will push the bar up, <coughs> it's going to put this uh, <coughs> structural steel rod excuse me, <coughs> into, uh, into tension. So we can figure that out as well. And then, of course, there's going to be stress and, or uh, reactions back here. Uh, I think I called that point D. <clears throat> Let's label them if we need to. A, C, B, D, and that's E then. So that's E, X, and E, Y. But we're, we're not concerned with those. We weren't asked about that. So if you were actually doing this, you'd have to figure it out. Okay, and the piece is going to deflect something like that because uh, the brass rod, is, the brass cylinder as it heats up is going to push that point up and since the bar won't bend then uh, it pushes it up as uh, a uniform um, uh, a similar triangle. Uh, yes, that is missing. It's uh, it's point three meters. Thank you, Travis. <coughs> okay, so uh, actually, let's label this. Uh, the distance point D moves. Point D is going to be made up of two parts to it. It's going to be partly, sorry, this is still supposed to be a D, partly due to the thermal expansion in D, uh, or in the brass cylinder. additional strain. So we have to figure out the two of those together. Now the del T is not too big a deal. That's just the uh, thermal part to it. We've got all those. And then the relative strain is going to be the uh, reaction its length, I guess I could put twos on all of those, since we do have uh, different materials. And so you can figure out all of those pieces and put them in. <clears throat> Remember though that RB at this point is unknown. We're going to need to find that uh, 
because we need to find the stress in that piece. So that'll give us one equation with RB unknown. You can also, though, do a static uh, free body diagram to at least get the ratio between RB and R. S, you get the ratio of those just from uh, summing the moments. Uh, without E would make sense because we don't need the, the parts of E. And you get R uh, S over R B, the ratio between those two is 0.4. You can just do that. That's uh, something you could have done last fall. Um, it leaves us with an extra unknown. Uh, but then we have one last little piece that we can throw in for the, uh, the whole thing that we also know as our last necessary equation that this is also 0.4 times del C. And that's just using Uh, similar triangles. So that should be all the pieces we need. We can then find RB from this. Uh, these two go in here. RB will be an unknown. Del C is an unknown. Uh, but we know then the ratio of the two. And uh, so we can put together all the last little pieces we need. R S um, L L one, I guess it is B one over A one. So we've got all the pieces we need then to find the reactions. Uh, those reactions are all unknown. Uh, so are the actual deflections themselves. But we have enough equations, enough unknowns to find them all. I think that's all the pieces, four equations, four unknowns. That's unknown, that's unknown, that's unknown, and that's unknown. But we have four equations, not in any particular order. One, these two together. So all that's left in it then is the algebra. And you can put it all together. So I have to decide if I want you to finish all the algebra. Oh, I won't kill you, we got the time. Chris, you're not in the mood. It might kill you. It might kill you on the last day. That's exciting news. Some of it's pretty straightforward. This RS over RB, remember, just comes from the summing the moments with respect to point E. You can't do any better than that because uh, we don't know what EY is and we don't need it. And then uh, some of the other pieces you can figure out completely. For example, that thermal, if that brass rod was free to go, it would actually move 162 micro inches. No, sorry, micrometers were in. SI units. So I'll save you a little trouble and give you that one. What else can I give you? Yeah. Uh, the 
these two will be in terms of RB, this will be in terms of RS, but we know the ratio between the two so we can solve for them there and with the uh, thermal expansion. So that's all the pieces. I think you can do it. together and, and the uh, unknowns will start uh, eliminating themselves or being found. We can check those. Okay, Phil. Mm -hmm. oh. like that, Phil. No, it's okay. Last day. You guys don't have anything else going on today, do you? No testing dynamics. You're kind of dressed up. What's going on? Oh. So it'll probably mess you up if I put chalk prints all over your coat. It would be very nice if you David is coming together to give you all the pieces you need. Yeah, I think so. thing of the year, except for the test next week, but that you're not even worried about. We don't need eight, uh, A1 because we're going to ask for the stresses in that one. But it'd be easy to find them because you're going to have a, <coughs> be able to find RS as well.
S is the force in the steel, so you don't want to use that for the force in the brass. Oh, there's times the point four. Okay, so you're getting a stress of seventy. Ah, no. Do you have something, Travis? No, but if you average your two, it'll be very close. Well, I got 37. <clears throat> we can check maybe some numbers as we go along. Uh, the thermal. Oh, I gave you delta 2, delta T. <coughs> the mechanical. Uh, Part is 4.2 times 10 to the minus 9th. But RB is unknown, so you have that part to it. And the units all check. What else can I give you? I can give you del C. 1184. C to L D and R B to R S. Anybody have anything left? It is R S. Uh, okay, I don't have to have R S written down, but you can get R B from that uh, because uh, of the, the static part. R S over R B is 0.4. He has 34. 34 what? Should be, should be positive since it's tension. Oh, yes, of course. And then you have RS, so you could find RB. figure out then, once you have the reactions, you can figure out what del C and del D actually are, how far those pieces actually move as the, the bar gets, the rigid bar gets pushed up a little bit. And that just comes from putting those pieces in those two numbers.
Chris, you have anything yet? Still working. Just uh, using this now that you have RS. No, I wrote them down right in my notes, but I always rewrite those because they're messy the first time I go through them. And you got something else entirely. Well, no, this is what you have Yeah. So I do have those swapped then, you think? That's you, what I have. You get the two of those, but for different. Because Del D should be larger than Del D equals rate. Is that right, then? That's what you have? That's what I have. That makes sense. 
Yeah, that doesn't make sense. I think what you have over in the corner where it says number four it should be delta. Uh, yeah, that's well, that's if it's if it's based on the steel and piece one. That eleven point eight four times ten to the negative ninth times R S equals point one two six meters. All right, let me see. Let me see if I gave you Okay, well T is one six that's right. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that might be swapped again. I think you're right. I think I think this is supposed to be a B. Which would then put these back to where they were. Is that right? If this is really del D, because I have del C, but then I have all ones in here and the X. Does that fix it then, Travis? You agree with that then? Yeah. Same numbers? I don't know. Or you just wrote them down and erased everything? That's a neat idea. Just write down the answers, erase everything else. Okay. It's all just algebra, though, before you get the letters straight. Get it in the end, David. No, I oh, I didn't actually write down. We we're supposed to find the stress in the end. Oh, we did that. So, uh, 37.6 megapascals. How much did you got? 26. Yeah, that's, um, so that's 
RB times 0.3, yeah, over 101 V sub VE, yeah, times 10 to the ninth Pascals times the area, which was 706 times 10 to the minus sixth meters uh, squared. Mostly all algebra. I'm going to leave a little bit if you have any last questions before next week's test. Right. If you don't, then stay on the algebra. I think it's eight Thursday morning. Eight one Wednesday morning. No, it's on the schedule, and I double checked it. It was right. Yeah, it's eight Wednesday morning. Books, open notes, the usual. Okay. Sure, that would help. I mean, that's what we got here. There's the answers right there. Still good at rock. Yeah. Plus, you all learned how, how you can trust my answers at the board. I think you've got some bigger Pascal's wrong consistently. Like yeah, so well, consistent. That's what's important. Like uh, I don't mind if I grade wrong as long as I grade wrong on everybody's. All right. So, any concerns about then next Wednesday's test? And you can do it either here or over in the lab. Open book, open notes. Just over. It's over the beam design, which was the, using those charts in the back. W8 by 28. Those kind of things. So we don't want to do any shaft you can do shaft design. Yeah, I gotta give you something you can get done. Um, yeah, and then the beam deflection curves. Uh, that could be used by direct integration or superposition. And then the, the columns. So no concerns? Well, concerns, just none you express at the moment. Okay. And I guess we're done.